This is the My Dark Path Podcast. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests, but I am not in heart to describe beauty. For when I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted, in no place save from the windows in the castle walls is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. And that is how Jonathan Harker describes Dracula's castle in the 1897 novel Dracula by Irish author Bram Stoker. The castle Harker describes is what we usually picture when we think of a vampire, a decaying medieval fortress, stone walls and towers, with a crypt in which the undead sleeps in a coffin. From the 1922 silent film Nosferatu through the universal horror Dracula, through today's versions found everywhere from the BBC Dracula to the animated Hotel Transylvania series, Dracula lives in a crumbling, cobweb-filled castle. Harker later describes the structure, quote, In the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from those tall black windows came no ray of light and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky, end quote. And wolves howl, bats fly, and everything is just creepy. And we have Stoker to thank for the aristocratic vampire who lives in this dilapidated space. His castle is so significant in the novel that it is hard to think of a dwelling of greater importance and influence in Gothic literature. Perhaps Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory, but even then, Dracula's castle has an enduring influence. It has inspired many movies, television stories, novels, video games, and even, appropriate for the Halloween season, haunted attractions and theme park rides. There's a Dracula's haunted castle in Niagara Falls, Canada, a Dracula's haunted house in Queenlands, Australia, and not to mention several Dracula's castle ghost trains as part of what the British call fun fairs. There's even a hotel in the Borgo Pass named Dracula's Castle, where Stoker located Dracula's Castle in his novel. There's money to be made in basing your haunted attraction on this famous location. The name recognition and the potential for a fright are instant. Several castles in Romania claim to be the real one of Dracula, and at least one Scottish castle claims to have inspired Stoker. Some of these castles are open to tours, and on some occasions, they even welcome overnight guests. The thing is, both the castle and the aristocratic vampire who lives in it are almost entirely Bram Stoker's invention. My travel in Romania and its neighboring countries initially caused me to look for locations that may have inspired Stoker, only to learn later that he never visited Romania and there is no Castle Dracula. Clearly, this can be disappointing when you want to believe that there may have been some fragment of truth behind vampire lore. But in many ways, the origin of the vampire story, while not spine-chilling, is fascinating and educational. Before Dracula, vampires were usually peasants buried in the village graveyard, walking from their graves, sometimes in broad daylight, who preyed on their neighbors and needed to have their heads cut off, their mouths stuffed with garlic, and then reburied face down at a crossroads to prevent them from rising again. Stoker's novel changed everything, and the vampire you know today is mostly the product of this Irish author's imagination. Paradoxically, much of what is popular knowledge about vampires is the result of Stoker, and sometimes even invented by him. But much of what we know about Dracula is from the plays and films, Stoker's Dracula is very different from the pop culture Dracula. Most folks know The Count only through pop culture, movies, television shows, cartoons, and even a certain chocolate-flavored breakfast cereal. The Dracula of the novel inspired, but bears little resemblance to the Dracula of modern-day culture. For example, in the novel, Dracula first appears as an old man with a long white mustache. When he arrives in England and has had access to fresh blood, he then sports a stylish black beard. 
That's right, Dracula always has facial hair in the novel. But we are used to the image created in the 1931 Universal film, a clean-shaven Bella Lugosi, in formal European wear, widow's peak to his hair, hypnotic eyes, greeting us with lines from the novel. He still lives in a creepy castle, though, filled with cobwebs and bats. Now, this is not an episode about Hollywood gets books wrong, however. I bring it up only because today we'll walk a path with dirt strewn from a vampire's grave and from Romanian history. Soil and land are integral to both the vampire myth and the story of Dracula, and the story and modern tourism link in odd and interesting ways. Now, another myth entirely of Stoker's invention is that vampires must sleep in their native soil. In Stoker's novel, Jonathan Harker observes, quote, the earth placed in wooden boxes when Dracula is preparing to leave Transylvania for England, and how when he opens Dracula's coffin on, quote, a pile of newly dug earth lay the count. In Stoker's novel, Jonathan Harker observes the earth placed in wooden boxes when Dracula is preparing to leave Transylvania for England, and how when Harker opens Dracula's coffin, he finds him on a pile of newly dug earth. Later, we learn that the Count has transported 50 cases of common earth to England, and so if one is discovered, he has others strategically located throughout the country. Van Helsing oversees the team of heroes to locate each of the caskets and place a holy Eucharist within them, so the vampire can no longer find rest. With a single remaining casket of native soil left to him, Dracula flees London for Transylvania where, now this is a spoiler alert, he meets his end in the Borgo Pass. His end, it should be noted, did not occur with a stake through the heart. And again, I remind you that most of what we know about Dracula comes from movies and not the original novel. For those interested, Harker stabs Dracula in the throat with a knife, cutting his head off while the Texan, Quincy Morris, simultaneously stabs the Count in the heart with a bowie knife. Now, the idea that vampires must sleep in their own soil shows up in numerous popular vampire texts, including the 1922 film Nosferatu, the Universal Dracula films, the 1944 film The Vampire Returns, several of the Hammer Studios' Dracula films, and Bram Stoker's Dracula that features Gary Oldman sleeping in his native soil. Others, like Van Helsing, the Underworld series, and even the television show What We Do in the Shadows, also show this idea. But today, we're going down a dark path through the Borgo Pass, down into the forest of the land, beyond the forest, and into the imagination of an Irish writer and the tourism industry of an Eastern European country to really learn the dirt on Dracula. Hi, I'm M.F. Thomas, and this is the My Dark Path podcast. In every episode, we explore the fringes of history, science, and the paranormal. So if you geek out over these subjects, you're among friends here at My Dark Path. And since friends stay in touch, join us on YouTube. I just released our third full video episode about Penemunda and the birth of the rocket. Eventually, I'll release a video as often as I release a podcast. Eventually. My Dark Path is a labor of love, and sometimes love takes time to develop fully. But I'm delighted at the progress the team is making on YouTube. I'd also like to say thank you to our growing number of listeners who subscribe to My Dark Path Plus via Patreon. In July, every Plus subscriber received a limited edition My Dark Path t-shirt, and everyone who is a subscriber by the end of October will get an autographed copy of my latest novel, Like Clockwork. Thank you for listening and choosing to walk the dark paths of the world with me. Let's get started with episode 43 and walk the dark path from England to Romania to America and see the deep connections between a certain famous vampire and the soil of his homeland. Part 1 As I'd mentioned earlier, before Dracula, vampires were virtually all peasants. The Count has but a single aristocratic ancestor. 
In the summer of 1816, the so-called year without a summer, due to a global cooling event from the eruptions of Mount Tambora in Indonesia, Dr. John Polidori was in Geneva with George Gordon, Lord Byron, and Percy and Mary Shelley. On a stormy night, the four agreed to a ghost story contest. Mary Shelley, of course, wrote Frankenstein from that night, introducing the doctor and his monster to the world. I shared the story of the writing of Frankenstein's monster in episode 15 of My Dark Path, Frankenstein and the Pacemaker. That is, if you'd like to learn more. Now, lesser known but equally significant, Polidori wrote a story that he then revised into the novel The Vampire. The title character, an aristocratic vampire named Lord Riven, meets Aubrey, a noble orphan, and they agree to travel Europe together. Riven first seduces the daughter of a mutual friend, and then, when Aubrey leaves him to go to Greece alone, he follows Aubrey, killing the Greek girl he's fallen in love with. Riven is seemingly killed by bandits, but Aubrey meets him again in London a year later and realizes Riven is a vampire. And what's more, Riven, now calling himself the Earl of Marsden, is engaged to Aubrey's sister, whom he then drains of blood, killing her on their wedding night. Aubrey dies as Riven flees into the night onto his next victims. It's clear the vampire, published in 1819, had a profound influence on Stoker's novel. However, as soon as Polidori's novel was published, it immediately was adapted for the stage under several different titles, the most famous being James Robinson Planche's The Vampire in 1820. For much of the 19th century, for every person who read Polidori's book, a dozen saw a play based on it creating a vogue for vampire plays and even leading to a new piece of stage technology, the vampire trap, a device that allowed the actor playing the vampire to escape, often replaced with a bat or a cloud of mist. By all accounts, the effect was quite spectacular. But this brings us to an important point. For all the literary significance of Polidori's and Stoker's novels, it was first the theater and then eventually the cinema that is most responsible for how we think about vampires in general and Dracula in particular. The first stage appearance of Dracula was on May 18, 1897, organized as a staged reading by Stoker at the Lyceum Theater in order to establish and protect the dramatic copyright of the text. The Lyceum, tangentially, was the theater that had premiered Planchet's The Vampire back in 1820 and had a working vampire trap already in-house. Stoker had asked Henry Irving to play the eponymous character, and Irving declined, although he attended the reading and responded dreadful when asked what he thought of it. The Count would not return to the stage until 12 years after Stoker's death in 1912. Stoker was an unpaid theater critic for Dublin's Evening Mail when the review he'd written about Henry Irving's 1876 Hamlet came to the actor's attention. Irving invited the critic to private performances and meals, eventually inviting Stoker to join the Lyceum Theater as its manager in 1878. Stoker's new job in the theater proved eye-opening. He'd experienced theater from the outside as a critic, but now was in the thick of it. Later he wrote of Irving, quote, Now I began to understand why everything was as it was, end quote. Stoker became an excellent manager of the theater, and his writings reflect both a deep understanding of the theater itself and of his own complicated relationship with Irving. So not only was the author of the book a man of the theater, I argue the titular character was actually a product of the stage. Scholars and biographers virtually all agree that the actual character of Dracula was inspired by and based on Henry Irving. Barbara Belford writes, Like Dracula, Irving was tall, thin, with a saturnine appearance and a hypnotic voice. In his personal reminiscences of Irving, Stoker admits to being enthralled and almost entranced the first time he met Irving. The power, the presence, the charisma, the vanity, the arrogance, the cruelty, and the sensuality. Stoker had hoped Irving would want to play the Count on stage, but Irving was not interested. A British actor, manager, an American playwright, a Hungarian actor, an American producer, however, would work to create the vampire that we today know as Dracula.
OMG is your source for engaging, relevant, evidence-based medical information. We feature interviews with top experts along with complimentary teaching slides and continuing education credits on selected podcasts. At onmedicalgrounds.com and on our OMG app, we provide perks to all posted podcasts by linking content so you can drink in more if you so choose. Please be sure to click the subscribe button to be alerted when we post new content or download our app to get all of our podcasts, slides, and continuing education credits in one convenient location. Hamilton Dean, a member of the Henry Irving Vacation Company in 1899, had become a manager and writer in his own right by the early 20s. Stoker's widow, Florence, gave Dean permission to adapt the novel for the stage, which he did in 1924, opening first in the provinces before bringing the show to London's Little Theatre with Raymond Huntley in the title role, transferring first to the Duke of York's Theatre and then the Prince of Wales Theatre. The show was then brought to the United States with additional script changes by John Balderson to make the script more comprehensible for Americans. This version premiered on Broadway to the same acclaim Dean's version did in London. It was the fertile soil of the United States in New York and Hollywood that the Count grew into the vampire we know and fear. The star of the Broadway version of the play, Hungarian actor Bela Blasco, had been cast in the title role and changed his name to Bela Lugosi and went on to achieve critical success in the role on stage. Later, Carl Lamel Jr. purchased the motion picture rights to Dracula, but he wanted another actor to play the Count on screen. But the actor passed away before filming could begin, and the producers grudgingly said that the Broadway actor could do it, thus forever linking Dracula with Lugosi and Lugosi with Dracula, and setting the standard for all future film adaptations. But let us remember, the 1931 Universal film was not adapted from the novel, but from the play, which was a dramatic adaptation of the novel. Now, tangentially, because of the success of the film, Lugosi, the actor Lamille did not want, was offered the role of the monster in Universal's next film, an adaptation of Frankenstein. Lugosi, figuring he would be unrecognizable under all the makeup, turned the role down, and it went to a British actor named William Henry Pratt. Pratt was told he needed to make his name more Eastern European, like Bela Lugosi's, so he took the stage name Boris Karloff. Now, the play had to streamline the novel, so it had cut the entire first third of the book, set in Transylvania. The play mostly takes place in London and the surrounding area, focusing on the recovery of Jonathan Harker from his mysterious trip to Transylvania and the threat to Lucy Seward. In the novel, there are two women who are best friends. Mina Murray, Harker's fiancée, who then becomes Mina Harker, and Lucy Westernra, who is courted by three men but is ultimately seduced, killed, and turned into a vampire by Dracula. The play combines the two women into one character, Lucy Seward, the daughter of John Seward, one of the suitors in the novel. Parker, Seward, and Van Helsing realize the new neighbor, Count Dracula, is actually a vampire and set out to defeat him before he can kill Lucy. The film, which could do what a stage play could not, added the Transylvania sequence back in, with the classic lines from the novel, quote, I never drink wine, end quote, and, quote, the children of the night, what music they make, end quote. It is the universal film based on the stage play and not the novel that became the template for all Draculas that followed. Part two. The vampiric count of Stoker's novel is named after Vlad Tepish, a 15th century ruler of Wallachia, a region in what is now Romania. He is also known as Vlad III, Vlad Dracula, the second son of Vlad Dracul. Some theorize Dracul means dragon and therefore Dracula is son of the dragon. This historic figure is best known as Vlad the Impaler. Stoker, as I mentioned earlier, never visited Romania or did any research into Vlad Tepish. So Vlad Dracula, best known for his cruelty, gave only his name to the vampire. All else was Stoker's invention. 
But in the early 1970s, as a result of scholarship on Stoker's novel, fans and scholars began to ask two questions. Where was Vlad the Impaler's castle, and was it a model for the castle in the novel? The answers are not simple or easy, and if you'll pardon the pun, require some digging. In the early 1970s, Romanian historian Radu Florescu was teaching at Boston College and researching Eastern European politics and culture. He discovered that his fellow BC faculty member Raymond T. McNally was equally fascinated by the novel Dracula and its depictions of Romania. The two began to research the history behind the book. In 1972, they published In Search of Dracula, a study of the history of Dracula and vampires that linked events in Stoker's novel and Romanian history. It is they who popularized the idea that Vlad Tepes was the model for Vlad Dracula. Their research in turn influenced Hollywood in the 1974 film Dracula starring Jack Palance as the Count and the 1992 film Bram Stoker's Dracula with Gary Oldman in the title role both directly link the vampire to this historic Romanian nobleman. In the novel, the castle Stoker describes has very specific features. Jonathan Harker is brought to the castle by a horse-drawn coach in which the coachman vanishes for part of the journey, but a bat seems to be guiding the horses. The castle is in Borgo Pass, which is located in the eastern Carpathian Mountains, connecting Transylvania with Vatra Dorni in present-day Buknovia, Moldavia. Harker boards a coach at an inn, a point near the summit of the pass, and rides a narrow, long road headed south into the mountains. Harker travels at night and cannot see much from the coach. He's dropped off in a large courtyard before a large old wooden door set in a stone wall. Harker sees the castle sits on a great rock, overlooking the surrounding forest, which is sliced through with several river gorges. The terrain is difficult to pass through, except by the narrow road. To the west is a deeply forested valley and mountain range. The castle is thus very difficult to reach and distant from any other human population. Over the course of the novel, written in the form of letters, journal entries, newspaper articles, and even a wax cylinder recording, Parker reveals much about the castle. There are no windows on the lower level, making it nearly impregnable to attack. Windows are only at a level where arrows and other projectiles could not reach, which means the lower levels are cast in darkness even in daytime, and must be lit with candles and torches. When Harker first enters the castle, he sees a winding staircase and long corridor. He's shown into an octagonal room, and then a bedroom that overlooks the courtyard. Down the hall from his room is a library full of books from England, which strikes him as odd. Why does the library of an aging count in Transylvania have a significant collection of English books? Harker discovers the other doors off the corridor in which the bedroom sits are all locked. Although told not to venture further, he enters another wing of the castle where he finds dust-covered but comfortable furniture, stained-glass windows that look out off the cliff, and he encounters the three brides of Dracula. By sneaking around on the forbidden lower levels, he eventually follows a staircase down to a tunnel that leads to the chapel, which is where the aristocratic dead of the castle were buried from medieval times on. It is in this chamber that he finds dozens of boxes of soil that the Count will take to England. Harker discovers the Count lying in one of the caskets on top of the dirt in a trance-like state. He does not notice at the moment, but later in the novel, when he returns to the castle with Professor von Helsing, that a large tomb at the heart of the chapel is simply labeled Dracula. When van Helsing discovers it, he opens the tomb and sanctifies it with communion and holy water, ensuring the vampire can never sleep there again. Part 3 Stoker did not invent the haunted castle. That trope had existed in Gothic literature for almost two centuries before. Novels as far back as 1764 used the setting of decaying haunted castles filled with degenerate aristocrats as a source of horror. 
Stoker merely took the Gothic castle, moved it to Romania, and put a vampire in it. It was a winning combination. Stoker had studied Romanian history and used some of the things he'd learned from his studies to create his own modern Gothic novel. There are two castles in Bistrita near the Borgo Pass Road. The first was built in the 13th century, about three miles north of the city, Dialu Citati. It fell into disuse, and by the 15th century, it was a dilapidated ruin as many stones were taken from it to fortify the town of Bistrita against increasing attacks from the Ottoman Turks. The second castle, called Castle Bistrita, was built by John Hunyadi, a contemporary of Vlad the Impaler. Hunyadi was sometimes an ally, sometimes a rival of his neighbor Vlad, who died in the siege of Belgrade. Although the Christian forces defeated the Turks and turned them away from this part of Eastern Europe as a result. Castle Bistrita no longer exists today. It was destroyed at the end of the 15th century by the local German-speaking population who despised their Hungarian overlords. Neither of these castles can be considered Count Dracula. Two other castles compete for the moniker Dracula's Castle in present-day Romania, Ponyari Castle and Bran Castle. Both are major tourist draws, and both have historical links to Vlad Tepes, and both, as I will discuss later, sell soil from their grounds as the genuine dirt from Dracula's castle. Vlad Tepes was the ruler of Wallachia, which is actually south of Transylvania on the other side of the Carpathian Mountains. Not having visited there in person, Stoker played fast and loose with the geography in his novel, putting a castle where there is none. Overlooking the river near the town of Campoling is Castle Braun. Castle Braun was originally built by the Knights of the Teutonic Order in the 13th century. In the following century, the Knights were expelled from the region and the castle was taken over by German merchants from Brasov, who used it as a trading post and for defense of the areas of Romania now occupied by the Germans. Although technically a part of the Hungarian Empire, the Carpathian Mountains and nearby areas were often hotly contested, and the ruler of Wallachia served as the military leader of the area. The Romanian government today promotes Brand Castle as the Castle Dracula, although Vlad Tepes never lived there. The book is fiction anyway, and the historic Vlad only gave his name to the fictional Dracula, and the castle itself seems very vampire castle-y. According to Radu Florescu and Raymond T. McNally, Bran Castle has the exact atmosphere Stoker attempted to conjure in his descriptions of the vampire's castle in the novel. The Washington Post claims, quote, images of Bran Castle supposedly reached Bram Stoker, who drew inspiration for his famous work from the travelogues and sketches by British diplomats and adventurers in what was then Wallachia, end quote. Another contender for the title of Castle Dracula is Setatia Poenari. The historic Vlad resided in Poenari Castle in the region of Wallachia. Draculascastle.com claims this to be the real Castle Dracula, since it was the domain of the real historical ruler. However, Stoker did not have this castle in mind when he wrote the novel. It is not mentioned in any of Stoker's research— and Poenari Castle is associated with the historic Vlad Tepes, and thus, for tourism purposes, claims the title of Dracula's castle as it was the castle of the historic Vlad Dracula, whereas Bran Castle claims to be the fictional count, and both compete to draw tourists to Romania. Yet another castle that can lay claim to inspiring Dracula's castle is Slane's Castle near Aberdeen in Scotland. In 1892, five years before Dracula was published, Bram Stoker took a holiday in Cruden Bay, Scotland. He'd taken time off from his demanding and stressful job as the manager of London's Lyceum Theatre and went to the North Sea coast of Scotland for peace, relaxation, and inspiration. He returned at least a dozen times in the next four years to what was then called Port Errol and its environs. Now remember, Stoker had never been to Romania. He had never actually seen or experienced any Romanian castles in person and thus drew inspiration from castles he encountered in the United Kingdom. We do know that Stoker was in Port Errol when he wrote the first few chapters of what would become Dracula. This makes historian and Scottish author Mike Shepard argue that Slane's castle was the model for the vampire's crumbling abode. 
The castle's ruins currently stand atop a cliff overlooking the North Sea, first built in the 17th century and replaced what is now called Old Slane's Castle, which was the former seat of power in the area. Slane's Castle was built up over the centuries, with new gardens being built in the 1890s when Stoker visited and worked on his novel. The castle, however, passed from owner to owner at the beginning of the 20th century, fell into ruin, and now exists only as a roofless shell. Stoker would later use the castle as the inspiration for Killian Castle in his 1903 novel, The Jewel of the Seven Stars. But one architectural element suggests that it might have also inspired Dracula's castle. Upon his arrival at the castle, Jonathan Harker is shown by Dracula into a small octagonal room, quote, lit by a single lamp and seemingly without a window of any sort, end quote. Now, this feature would be unusual in any castle, but Slane's castle has just such a distinctive room. So, while Dracula's castle does not actually exist, it seems to be an amalgamation of several different castles, some Stoker visited, some he only read about, and some that people simply associate with Dracula, both because we seem to need to seek the fictional to be real, and also there is money to be made. Part 4 In Stoker's novel, Harker and Quincy decapitate and stab Dracula, but the work isn't over. Van Helsing tells the others, quote, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth so sacred of holy memories that he is brought from a far distant land for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus, we defeat him with his own weapon, for we still make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man, and now we sanctify it to God. End quote. So let's unpack that. Dracula filled 50 caskets of dirt from the graveyard of his castle, as that was the dirt he was buried in. And, according to Stoker, vampires must sleep in the consecrated soil they were buried in. But vampires may not enter consecrated land. And just as a crucifix stops Dracula, so too would a church or presumably a synagogue or mosque or temple or any consecrated building, as vampires may not enter anything holy. The astute reader, or in this case listener, may ask why Dracula must sleep in consecrated soil if he cannot be near consecrated things. And the answer to that is taking the soil from the ground desecrates it, removes it from that which is holy, and makes it unholy. And by using holy water and communion wafers, Professor Van Helsing makes the desecrated dirt holy again, and therefore an anathema to Dracula. But there's something more in Stoker's invention here. Dracula must sleep in the soil of Transylvania, and so he brings it with him to England. And there's a larger metaphor here, I suspect, for us bringing our homeland with us when we travel. After all, we are a product of our homeland, and it is in us. And in Dracula's case, he sleeps in the soil that must be from the vampire's home country because they need a connection to their home ground, and because that earth is drenched in all the blood that has been spilled on it throughout history. It's not just desecrated soil, it's the soil of the traumatic history of the Carpathians, Transylvania, and Romania. Dracula, in short, is linked with the soil, and not just any soil, but Transylvanian soil from his castle. And that soil, both the land of Romania and the actual dirt, have become very important to Dracula fans. Stoker's Dracula came from the land beyond the forest and died at the Borgo Pass on the way back to it. When Romania was still a communist dictatorship, however, enterprising entrepreneurs still found a way to connect vampire fans with the soil of Transylvania and Dracula. In the mid-1970s, advertisements appeared in Warren Publishing magazines as Famous monsters of filmland, Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirilla, all advertising soil from Dracula's castle. It's clear that based on the timing that the folks at Warren Publications were taking advantage of the explosion in interest in Dracula's castle created by the publication of In Search of Dracula. The ad proclaimed in blood-red letters, Authentic Soil from Dracula's Castle. Other statements said, a fascinating memento of the greatest horror story ever told, 
and another one gram of soil in each amulet. The magazines advertised a gold-colored plastic coffin with a clear plastic cover on a gold-plated chain. Inside was the promised one gram of soil from Dracula's castle. But which one? The ad only specified Dracula's castle. Warren Publications later announced the soil was taken from a castle near the edge of Transylvania tied to Vlad's reign. That might make this necklace the ultimate postmodern souvenir, genuine, authentic dirt in a cheap plastic coffin claiming to be from a castle that actually never existed. Only 5,000 were made, declared the ad, each accompanied by a certificate of authenticity announcing its number. Now, more recently, Poenari Castle also sells vials of earth taken from the castle grounds. The internet company Mini Museum sells glass vials containing a small amount of dirt from Poenari Castle. Quote, it was gathered from the base of the very old building, end quote, the advertisement reads, so it's possible you may find small bits of stone or clay mixed with the soil. Another advertisement reads, the earth in this vial comes from the grounds of Setati Poenari, the citadel of Tepis ancestors. Perched high on a steep precipice of rock, the castle was one of his favorite haunts. Now note the language at the end which connects Poenari Castle with Stoker's description of Dracula's castle. It's both fascinating and perhaps obvious that in the 70s, in the wake of Florescu and McNally's book, and then again in this decade, people are looking for authentic connections to a past, that dirt from a castle would be a commodity that could be sold and allowed fans to link to a favorite fictional character. And what's especially interesting is that, as we've discussed today, there is no real Dracula's castle, only a series of castles linked with his namesake or that inspired the description in the fictional work. Yet, there's something deeper happening here. The history of Romania is a sad and a proud one. Standing at the crossroads of Central and Southern Europe and Central Asia, Romania was on the front lines in the wars between Christian Europe and the Ottoman Empire. For much of its history, Romania was defending itself from Germany to its west in the Ottomans to the south. And then in the 20th century, it had a military dictatorship backed by the Nazis. After the overthrow of that dictatorship, Romania switched sides during World War II. And after having fought alongside the Germans and participating in the Holocaust, Romania then fought against the Germans for the Soviets, who later installed a communist regime in 1946. In 1965, Nicolae Croescu took power and ruled Romania as a communist dictatorship until he and his wife Elena were executed by firing squad on Christmas Day, 1989, in the revolution that swept the nation with the fall of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain. Romania was a poor country with many resources that had been poorly managed during the communist regime. One thing Romania did have, however, was Transylvania and a world obsessed with Dracula. And very rapidly, Romania developed a tourism industry centered around Dracula, accounting for over 5% of its GDP by 2013, with almost 10 million tourists visiting every year, many of whom seek out the castles associated with the historic Vlad Tepes and the fictional Dracula. In a sense, Bram Stoker owes Romania a debt for giving him a setting, a name, and the inspiration for his novel. And Romania perhaps also owes Bram Stoker a debt, for as folklorist and professor of cultural studies at the University of Turku, Thomas Hovey observes, Romania has made Dracula a very lucrative part of its cultural heritage. People can go on Dracula tours, visit castles we've discussed here, purchase Dracula souvenirs, and experience the novel in the place in which it's set. Professor Hovey writes, quote, Dracula tourism is unique as it combines a known historical figure with a fictional character that derives completely from outside the history and culture of the original historical figure, end quote. Romania has taken this very British vampire from a very Irish author and made it a very Romanian tourist attraction, combining culture, history, and heritage with fiction and tourism promotion. And what could be more exciting than experiencing the novel on the very soil in which it's set? Hovey discusses how Halloween has become one of the most significant holidays for the tourist industry in Romania. 
which is remarkable considering it was historically never celebrated there in any way, shape, or form. In that way, it reminds me of the interesting and unlikely Japanese fascination with Christmas and Kentucky Fried Chicken. But Dracula's Halloween tours and events make the end of October one of the busiest times in Romania. Halloween and Dracula are neither culturally nor historically accurate, but they generate tremendous revenue for Romania and the tourist business. I guess in the end there are three big takeaways from our trip down the dark path to Dracula's castle. The first is the power this novel had in its 125 years of existence to completely transform how the vampire is understood and to transform Romania into a tourist destination. The second is how we know this novel and the vampire we all know is actually filtered through the play, the film, and popular culture, meaning that there is no Dracula, but perhaps many, many Draculas. Think about what a profound shaping influence Bram Stoker has had on our culture with a single novel. And lastly, and perhaps most interestingly, it's how much we value a place where something happened, or even a real place where a fictional event is set. Riverside, Iowa, for example, has a plaque noting it is the future birthplace of James T. Kirk of Star Trek. In Pasadena, people stop every day and take photos in front of the Myers house from the film Halloween, perhaps unaware that it's only the exterior of the house that was used in the film. And of course, Michael Myers is not real. Yet the home is a tourist attraction. And we value our pop culture narrative so strongly that we will visit replicas of things that never existed, go to places where fictional events were set, and even buy dirt from a castle linked to an historic figure who never actually lived there, but who served as a namesake for a fictional vampire that never existed. We seek authenticity, the real, even in the fictional. We make objects and places important because the stories give our lives meaning and we seek to connect with them and somehow even own a piece of them, even if that piece is a plastic coffin filled with a gram of dirt. Thank you for listening to My Dark Path. I'm M.F. Thomas, the creator and host I produced this show and our audio engineer is Dom Purdy. This story was researched and prepared for us by Kevin Wetmore. I'm grateful to each of them and the entire My Dark Path team. Please take a moment to give My Dark Path a five-star rating wherever you're listening. This really helps the show and we love to hear from you. Again, thanks for walking the dark paths of history, science, and the paranormal with me, including today's path, strewn with the soil from a vampire's grave. Until next time, good night and happy Halloween.